Monsieur le Président. President, members of Parliament. One of the most courageous minds of our time, Andrei Shakarov, someone who was so admired by this Parliament, always spoke of his unshakable faith in the hidden strength of the human spirit. Over the last six months, Europeans have really shown this strength of spirit. We have seen this with the care workers who moved into care homes to look after those who were ill and elderly. We saw this with the doctors and nurses who became family members for those who were breathing their last breath. The frontline workers who day and night, week after week, took risks so we didn't have to. Their empathy, their courage, and their sense of duty is an inspiration to us all. And I would like to begin this speech by paying tribute to them. Their stories also reveal a lot about the state of our world and the state of our union. They show the power of humanity and the sense of mourning which will live long in our society. And they expose to us the fragility all around us. A virus a thousand times smaller than a grain of sand exposed how delicate life can be. It laid bare the strains on our health systems and the limits of a model that values wealth above well-being. It brought into sharper focus the planetary fragility that we see every day through melting glaciers, burning forests, and now through global pandemics. It changed the way we behave and communicate keeping our arms at length and our faces behind masks. It showed us just how fragile our community of values really is and how quickly it can be called into questions around the world and even here in our union. But people want to move out of this corona world, out of this fragility, out of this uncertainty, they are ready for change, and they are ready to move on. And this is the moment for Europe, the moment for Europe to lead the way from this fragility towards a new vitality. And that is what I want to talk about today. Honorable members, I say this because in the last month we have rediscovered the value of what we hold in common. As individuals, we have all sacrificed a piece of our personal liberty for the safety of others. And as a union, we all shared a part of our sovereignty for the common good. We turned fear and division between member states into confidence in our union. We showed that it is possible and what is possible when we trust each other and we trust the European institutions. And with all of that, we choose to not only repair and recover for the here and now, but to shape a better world, a better way of living for the world of tomorrow. And this is next generation EU. This is our opportunity to make change happen by design and not by disaster or by diktat from others in the world. To emerge stronger by creating opportunities for the world of tomorrow and not just building contingency, contingencies for the world of yesterday. We have everything we need to make this happen. We have shaken off the old excuses and home comforts. 
We have the vision. We have a plan. We have the investment. It is now time to get to work. This morning, I've sent a letter of intent to President Sassoli and Chancellor Merkel on behalf of the German presidency, outlining the Commission's plan for the year ahead. I will not present every initiative today, but I want to touch on what our union must focus on in the next 12 months. Honorable members, the people of Europe are still suffering. It is a period of profound anxiety for millions who are concerned about the health of their families, the future of their jobs, or simply getting through till the end of the month. The pandemic and the uncertainty that goes with it is not over. And the recovery is still in its early stage. So our first priority is to pull each other through this and to be there for those that need it. And thanks to our unique social market economy, Europe can do just that. It is above all a human economy that protects us against the great risks of life, illness, ill fortune, unemployment, and poverty. It offers stability and helps us better absorb shocks. It creates opportunities and prosperity by promoting innovation, growth, and fair competition. Never before has that enduring promise of protection, stability, and opportunity been more important than it is today. Allow me to explain why. First, Europe must continue to protect lives and livelihoods. This is all the more important in the middle of a pandemic that shows no sign of running out of steam or intensity. We know how quickly numbers can spiral out of control. So we must continue to handle this pandemic, pandemic with extreme care, responsibility and unity. In the last six months, our health systems and workers have produced miracles. Every country has worked to do its best for its citizens. And Europe has done more together than ever before. When the member states closed borders, we created green lanes for goods. When more than 600,000 European citizens were stranded all over the world, the EU brought them back home. When some countries introduced export bans for critical medical goods, we stopped that and ensured that critical medical goods should go where it was needed. We worked with the European industry to increase the production of masks, of gloves, of tests, of ventilators. Our civil protection mechanism ensured that doctors from Romania could treat patients in Italy or that Latvia could send masks to its Baltic neighbors. And we achieved all that without having full competencies. So for me, it is crystal clear we need to build a stronger European Health Union. It is time to do that. And to start making this a reality, we must now draw the first lessons from the health crisis. We need to make our new e for eu for health program future-proof. And this is why I had proposed to increase funding. And I'm grateful that this parliament is ready to fight for more funding and remedy the cuts made by the European Council. And we need to strengthen our crisis preparedness and management of cross-border health issues. As a first step, we will propose to reinforce and empower the European Medicines Agency and ECDC, our Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. 
as a second step, we will build a European BARDA, an agency for biomedical advanced research and development. This new agency will support our capacity and readiness to respond to cross-border threats and emergencies, whether of natural or deliberate origin. We need strategic stockpiling to address supply chain dependencies, notably for pharmaceutical goods. And as a third step, it is clearer than ever that we must discuss the question of health competencies. And I think it is a noble and urgent task to do this for the Conference on the Future of Europe. And finally, and because it was a global crisis, we need to learn the global lessons. This is why, along with Prime Minister Conte and the Italian G20 presidency next year, I will convene a global health summit next year in Italy. This will show Europeans that our union is there to protect them all. And this is exactly what we have done when it comes to workers. When I took office, I vowed to create an instrument to protect workers and businesses from external shocks. Because I knew from my experience as a Minister for Labour and Social Affairs that these schemes work. They keep people in jobs. They keep the skills in the companies. And, of course, they keep the business, the, the SMEs in business. These SMEs are the motor of our economy and they will be the engine of our recovery. And this is why the Commission created the SURE program. And I want to thank this House for working on it in record time. If Europe has so far avoided mass unemployment seen elsewhere, it is thanks in large part to the fact that around 40 million people applied for short-time work schemes. The speed and the unity of purpose means that 16 countries will soon receive almost 90 billion euros from SURE to support workers and companies. From Lithuania to Spain, it will give peace of mind to families who need that income to put food on the table or to pay the rent, and it will help protect millions of jobs, incomes and companies right across our union. This is real European solidarity in action. And it reflects the fact that in our union the dignity of work must be sacred. But the truth is that for too many people, Work no longer pays. Dumping wages destroys the dignity of work, penalizes the entrepreneur who pays decent wages, and distorts fair competition in the single market. And this has to stop. And this is why the Commission will put forward a legal proposal to support member states to set up a framework for minimum wages. Everyone must have access. Everyone must have access to minimum wages, either through collective bargaining or through statutory minimum wages. I personally, I am a strong advocate of collective bargaining, and the proposal will fully respect national competences and traditions. We have seen in many member states that introduced collectively bargained minimum wages, how a well-negotiated minimum wage secures jobs and creates fairness, both for the workers and for the companies who really value them. So, honorable members, minimum wages work, and it is time that work paid.
The second promise of the social market economy is that of stability. By showing it was united and up to the task, Europe provided the stability that our economies need. And we'll not forget, when the crisis hit, the Commission immediately triggered the General Escape Clause for the very first time in our history. We flexibilized our European funds and state aid rules, authorizing more than 3 trillion euro in support to companies and industry. From fishermen in Croatia to farmers in Greece, from SMEs in Italy to freelancers in Denmark. The European Central Bank took decisive action through the PEP program. The Commission proposed next generation EU in record time, thus combining investment and the much needed reforms. The Council endorsed it in record time. This House is working towards voting on it with maximum speed. Honourable Members, for the first time and for exceptional times, Europe has put in place its own common tools to complement national fiscal stabilizers. This is a remarkable moment of unity in the European Union, and this is an achievement we should take collective pride in. We made that. And now it's time to hold our course. We have all seen the forecasts. We can expect our economies to start moving again after a 12% drop in GDP in the second quarter. But as the virus lingers, so does the uncertainty here in Europe and around the world. So this is definitely not the time to withdraw support. Our economies need continued policy support, and a delicate balance will need to be struck between providing financial support and ensuring fiscal sustainability. In the longer term, there is no greater way to stability and competitiveness than through a stronger economic and monetary union. Confidence in the euro has never been stronger. The historic agreement on next generation EU shows the political backing that it has. And we must now use this opportunity to make structural reforms in our economies and complete the capital markets union and the banking union. Deep and liquid capital markets are essential to give businesses access to the finance they need, and they need it to grow and invest in recovery and in the future, and they are also a prerequisite to further strengthen the international role of the euro. So let's get to work and finally complete this generational project. And the third enduring promise is the promise of opportunity. The pandemic reminded us of many things we have, may have forgotten or we may have taken for granted. We were reminded how linked our economies are and how crucial a fully functioning single market is to our prosperity and to the way we do things. The single market is all about opportunity. Opportunity for consumers to get value for money, Opportunities for a company to sell everywhere in Europe. And opportunities for the industry to, gl to drive global competitiveness. And for all of us, it is about the opportunity to make the most of the freedoms we cherish as Europeans. It gives our companies the scale they need to prosper and the safe heaven for them in times of troubles. We rely on it every day to make our lives easier. And it is crucial for managing the crisis and recovering our strength. So let's give it a boost. We must tear down the barriers of the single market. We must cut red tape. We must step up implementation and enforcement. And we must restore the four freedoms 
in full and as fast as possible. The linchpin of this is a fully functioning Schengen area of free movement. And we will work with Parliament and Member States to bring this high up on our political agenda and we will propose a new strategy for the future of Schengen. Based on this strong internal market, the European industry has long powered our economy, providing a stable living for millions and creating the social hubs around which our communities are built. We presented a new industry strategy in March to ensure industry could lead the TRIN green and digital transition. The last six months have only accelerated that transformation at a time when the global competitive landscape is fundamentally changing. As to, we have to keep up. And this is why we will update our industry strategy in the first half of next year and adapt our comp competition framework, which should also keep pace. Honourable members, all this will ensure Europe gets back on its feet. But as we pull through together, we must also propel ourselves forward in the world of tomorrow. And there is no urgent need for acceleration, no more urgent need for acceleration than when it comes to the future of our fragile planet. While much of the world's activity froze during lockdowns and shutdowns, the planet continued to get dangerously hotter. And we see it all around us. From houses evacuated due to the glacier collapse on the Mont Blanc, to fires burning through Oregon, to crops destroyed in Romania by the most severe droughts in decades. But we also saw nature coming back into our lives. We longed for green spaces and clean air, for our mental health and our physical well-being. We know change is needed and we also know it is possible. The European Green Deal is our blueprint to make that transformation. At the heart of it is our mission to become the first climate neutral continent in 2050. But we will not get there with the status quo. We need to go faster and we need to do things better. We looked in depth in every sector to see how fast we could go and how to do it in a responsible, evidence-based way. We held a wide public consultation and conducted an extensive impact assessment. And on this basis, the European Commission is proposing to increase the 2030 targets for emission reduction to at least 55%. I recognize that this increase from 40 to 55 is too much for some and not enough for others. But our impact assessment clearly shows that our economy and industry can manage this. And they want it. Just yesterday, 170 business leaders and investors, from SMEs to some of the world's biggest companies, wrote to me calling on Europe to set a target at least at 55%. Our impact assessment clearly shows that meeting this target would put the European Union firmly on track for climate neutrality by 2050 and for meeting our Paris Agreement obligations. And if others follow our lead, the world will be able to keep warming below one5 degrees Celsius. I'm fully aware that many of our partners are far away from that, but we have to lead. 
and I will come back to the carbon border adjustment mechanism later. But for us, the 2030 target is ambitious, it's achievable, and it is beneficial for Europe. We can do it. And we have already shown that we can do it. While emissions dropped 25% since 1990, our economy grew more than 60%. The difference is now that we now have the technology, we have way more expert expertise, and we have the investment. And we are already embarking towards a circular economy with carbon neutral production. We want to be leading in the world on that. We have more young people pushing for change. We have more proof that what is good for the climate is good for business and is good for us all. And we have a solemn promise to leave no one behind in this transformation. With our Just Transition Fund, we will support the regions that have a bigger and more costly change to make. We have it all. Now it's our responsibility to implement it and to make it happen. And I want you at my side and I invite you for this endeavor because we only can do it together. This is our mission on the European level, honorable members. Meeting this new target will reduce our energy import dependency, will create millions of extra jobs and more than half air pollution. To get there, we have to start now. By next summer, we will revise all of our climate and energy legislation to make it fit for 55. We will enhance emission trading, boost renewable energy, improve energy efficiency, reform energy taxation. But the mission of the European Green Deal involves much more than cutting emissions. This is important, but it is about making systemic modernization across our economy, society and industry. It is about building a stronger world to live in. Our current levels of consumption of raw material, energy, water, food and land use is not sustainable. We need to change how we treat nature, how we produce and consume how we live and work, eat and heat, travel and transport. So we will tackle everything from hazardous chemicals to deforestation to pollution. This is a plan for a true recovery. It is an investment plan for Europe. And this is where next generation EU will make a real difference. Firstly, 37% of next generation EU will be spent directly on our European Green Deal objectives. And it, I will ensure that it also takes green financing to the next level. We are world leaders in green finance and we are the largest issuer of green bonds worldwide. We are leading the way in developing a reliable EU green bond standard. And I can announce today that we will set a target of 30% of next generation EU's 750 billion euros to be raised through green bonds. <clears throat> Secondly, next generation EU should invest in lighthouse European projects with the biggest impact, hydrogen, renovation, and one million electric charging points. And allow me to explain how this could work. Two weeks ago in Sweden, a unique fossil-free steel pilot began test operations. It will replace coal with hydrogen to produce clean steel. This shows the potential of hydrogen to support our industry with a new with a clean license to operate. I want next generation EU to create new European hydrogen valleys to modernize our industries, to power our vehicles, and to bring new life to our rural areas. The second example, 
are the buildings we live and work in. Our buildings generate more than 40% of our emissions. They need to become less wasteful, less expensive, and more sustainable. And we know that the construction sector can even be turned from a carbon source into a carbon sink if organic building materials like wood and smart technologies like AI are being used. So I want next generation EU to kickstart a European renovation wave and make our union a leader in the circular economy. But this is not just an environmental or economic project. It needs to be a new cultural project for Europe. Every movement has its own look and feel. And we need to give our systemic change its own distinct aesthetics to match style with sustainability. And this is why we will set up a new European Bauhaus, a co-creation space where architects, artists, students, engineers, designers work together to make that happen. This is next generation EU. This is shaping the world we want to live in. A world served by an economy that cuts emission, boosts competitiveness, reduces energy poverty, creates rewarding jobs and improves quality of life. A world where we use digital technologies to build, build a healthier, a greener society. And this can only be achieved if we all do it together. And I will insist that recovery plans don't just bring us out of the crisis, but also help us propel Europe forward in the world of tomorrow. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Honorable Members of the Parliament, let us imagine for one minute that this pandemic occurs during a time without digital technology. Quarantine spent in full isolation, cut off from family, relatives, supply problems, inability to go to work. Surely this is what it must have looked like a hundred years ago in the last pandemic. A century on, modern technology enables us in a time of severe pandemic for young people to pursue their studies at home, people to work from home, keeping production lines open and distributing those products. It allows public administration to provide important services to citizens. In a matter of just a few weeks, we witnessed greater progress and digital transformation than over several years. But we are coming up against the limit of what analog technology will allow us to do now. This transition has just begun. The forthcoming decade will and must be Europe's digital decade. We need a common plan for a digital Europe with clearly set out targets and objectives for 2050. We need targets for 2030 in the field of connectivity, digital com competence, skills, public administration and many other areas. We also need clear principles, the right to pri privacy, the right to access, freedom of expression, the free flow of data and cybersecurity. In order to achieve all this, Europe must take a leadership role or else it will be following others who will setting, be setting the standards for us. This is why quick and decisive action is needed so badly now. There are three areas that we, I believe, must focus on. First of all, data. When it comes to personal data, B to C, business to consumer, Europe was too slow and has had to follow others. This must not happen again with industrial data. And I have some good news. Europe is in the lead in this field. We have the technology and we have the industry 
but this alone will not win us the race. The quantity of industrial data will multiply fourfold over the next five years, and that will bring with it opportunities. So now is the time to allow businesses, startups, SMEs to fully exploit the potential. Industrial data is invaluable when it comes to developing new products and new services. However, the reality looks very different. 80% of industrial data that are gathered and collected never get put to any use, which is a huge waste. A true data economy would be a powerful driver for in innovation, however. This is why Europe must secure the data and make it widely accessible. We need common data collection in the field of energy and health care, for example, which will boost the activity of research clusters, businesses, research centers must be able to access in a secure way this data and use its potential. This is why in the context of next generation EU, we will be establishing a European cloud on the basis of Gaia-X. The second area that we must focus on is technology itself, in particular artificial intelligence. Now, whether it's for precision farming or precision healthcare and early diagnosis in healthcare or autonomous driving, AI opens up whole new worlds for us. It's truly fantastic. But these worlds need to be regulated too. Algorithms must not create any black boxes and there must be clear rules and procedures when things go wrong. The European Commission will be proposing a new European law in this field, which will tackle the issue of supervision of personal data and control of personal data. Every time we access a website and it asks us to establish a new digital identity or set up a user profile or to register on a platform, the fact is we simply don't know what will happen to our data. We must put a stop to this. This is why the European Commission will come forward with a proposal for a new secure digital identity, one that we can really trust and that citizens can use Europe-wide for everything, whether it's right, uh, renting a bicycle or paying taxes. An identity that you have full control over, where you can control the data that is transferred and how it is used. That is our idea of a technology focused and centered around people, for the service of people. The third focal point, infrastructure. We must keep up with the racing pace of technology. And if we want to build a Europe that is on an equal footing with others, then we simply cannot allow 40% of people in rural areas to still be lagging behind when it comes to broadband access. Broadband connections are the foundation for home learning, home shopping, home office working, and many of the services that are now being offered online. Without broadband, it's simply impossible to run a business these days or to expand a business. Fast data connections are a basis, a requirement, and an opportunity for rural areas to develop. It's only with this technology that rural areas will fully be able to exploit their potential and attract investment and populations. The investment leap that we're going to see through Next Generation EU is a one-time opportunity. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to move forward with development in this field. This is why we want to focus on secure connectivity, developing 5G, 6G and fi uh, glass, fiberglass. We need to use this opportunity to come up with a common approach 
for connectivity and the development of digital infrastructure in Europe. Now, none of this is an end in itself. This is about no less than Europe's digital sovereignty. And in this context, I'm very pleased to announce an 8 billion investment in supercomputer technology. This will be high-tech made in Europe. And we wish for European industry to be able to develop its own driver for investment in digital economy, one that will allow us to use data in a way that is energy efficient and secure. All this and more for me really is part of this digital um, Europe. Honourable members, if we really press on the accelerator pedal now, we must ensure that we remain adhere to our principle. We allow that Europe retains control over its future, sets the course for its future. We have everything we need in order to realise this dream. Industry is clamouring for a plan and that plan is now in place. There's never been a better time to invest in technology across Europe, from Sofia to Lisbon, um, across the continent. We want to open new digital clusters. We have the idea, we have the investment power to be truly successful in this field, which is why 20% of the next generation EU budget will be earmarked for digital development and with this we hope to propel Europe into the digital age on the basis of our values, our strengths and our ambitions. Europe is determined to use this transition to build the world we want to live in and that of course extends well beyond our external borders. The pandemic has simultaneously shown both the fragility of the global system and the importance of cooperation to tackle collective change. And in the face of the crisis, some around the world choose to retreat into isolation. Others actively destabilize the system. Europe chose to reach out. Our leadership is not about self-serving propaganda. It is not about Europe first. It is about being the first to seriously answer the call when it is needed. In the pandemic, European planes delivering thousands of tons of protective equipment landed everywhere, from Sudan to Afghanistan, Somalia to Venezuela. We know no of us will ever be safe until all of us are safe. And we know wherever we live, whatever we have, there has to be access, affordable and safe access to vaccines, treatments and diagnostics. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was no funding, there was no global framework for a COVID-19 vaccine. There was just the rush to be the first one to get one. And this was the moment when the European Union stepped up to lead the global response. With civil society, with G20, with WHO and others, we brought more than 40 countries together to raise 16 billion euros to finance research on vaccines, on tests, on treatments for the whole world. And this is Europe's unmatched convening power we can be so proud of. It is not enough to find a vaccine. We need to make sure that European citizens and those around the world have access to it. And just this month, the European Union joined the COVAX Global Facility and contributed 400 million euro to help ensure that safe vaccines are available not only for those who can afford it, but for everyone who needs it. Because we know vaccine nationalism puts lives at risks 
Only vaccine cooperation saves lives. <laughs> Honorable members, we are firm believers in the strength and value of cooperating in international bodies. It is with a strong United Nation that we can find long-term solutions for crises like Libya and Syria. It is with a strong World Health Organization that we can better prepare and respond to global pandemics or local outbreaks, be it corona or Ebola. And it is with a strong World Trade Organization that we can ensure fair competition for all. But the truth is also that the need to revitalize and to reform the multilateral system has never been so urgent. Our global system has grown into a creeping paralysis. Major powers are either pulling out or they're taking the institutions hostage for their own interests. And neither road will lead anywhere. Yes, we need change, but we need change by design and not by destruction of our international system. And this is why I want the European Union to lead reforms on WHO and WTO so that they are fit for today's world. But we know that multilateral reforms take time, and in the meantime, the world will not stop. Without any doubt, there's a clear need for Europe to take clear positions and quick actions on global affairs. Two days ago, the latest EU-China leaders' meeting took place. The relationship between the European Union and China is simultaneously one of the most strategically important and one of the most challenging we have. And from the outset, we have said China is a negotiating partner, an economic competitor, and a systemic rival. We have interests in common on issues such as climate change, and China has shown it is willing to engage through a high-level dialogue, but we expect also China to live up to its commitments in the Paris Agreement and to lead by example. In the economic field, there's still hard work to do on a fair market access for European companies reciprocity and overcapacity. And we continue to have an unbalanced trade and investment partnership. And there is no doubt that we promote very different systems of governance and society. We believe in the universal value of democracy and the rights of the individual. Europe is certainly not without issues. Think, for example, of growing anti-Semitism. But criticism and opposition, we discuss them here publicly. Criticism and opposition are not only accepted, but they are legally protected. There is an open debate about all these issues. So we must call out human rights abuses whenever and wherever they occur, be it on Hong Kong, or be it with the Uyghurs. But what holds us back? Why are even, even simple statements on EU values delayed, watered down, or held hostage for other motives? When member states say, Europe is too slow, I say, be courageous and finally move to qualified majority voting, at least on human rights and sanctions implementation. This House has called many times for a European Magnitsky Act 
And I can announce that we will now come forward with a proposal. We need to complete our toolbox. <laughs> Honorable members, be it in Hong Kong, Moscow or Minsk, Europe must take a clear and swift position. And I want to say it loud and clear. The European Union is on the side of the people of Belarus. We have all been moved by the immense courage of those peacefully gathering in the Independence Square or taking part in the fearless women's march. The elections that brought them into the streets were neither free nor fair. And the brutal response by the government ever since has been shameful. The people of Belarus must be free to decide their own future for themselves, they are not pieces on someone else's chessboard. And to those that advocate closer ties with Russia, I say that the poisoning of Alexei Navalny with an advanced chemical agent is not a one-off. We have seen the pattern in Georgia and in Ukraine, in Syria and Salisbury, and an election meddling around the world. And this pattern is not changing, and no pipeline will change that. <laughs> Turkey is and will always be an important neighbor. But while we are close together on the map, the distance between us appears to be growing. Yes, Turkey is in a troubled neighborhood. And yes, it is hosting millions of refugees for which we support them with considerable funding. But none of this is justification for attempts to intimidate their neighbors. Our member states, Cyprus and Greece, can always count on Europe's full solidarity on protecting their, their legitimate sovereignty rights. <laughs> De-escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean is in our mutual interest. The return of exploratory vessels to Turkish ports in the past few days is a positive step in this direction. This is necessary to create the much needed space for dialogue refraining from unilateral actions and resuming talks in good faith is the only path forward, the only path to stability and lasting solutions. Honorable members, as well as responding more assertively to global events, Europe must deepen and refine its partnerships with its friends and allies. And this starts with revitalizing our most enduring partnerships. We might not always agree with recent decisions of the White House, but we will always cherish the transatlantic alliance based on shared values and history and an unbreakable bond between our people. So whatever may, what may happen later this year, we are ready to build a new transatlantic agenda to strengthen our bilateral partnership, be it on trade, on tax, or taxation, and we are ready to work together on reforming the international system we built together jointly with like-minded partners. For our own interests and in the interest of the common good, we need new beginnings with old friends on both sides of the Atlantic and on both sides of the Channel. The scenes in this very room when we held hands and sang goodbye with old Lang Syne spoke a thousand words. And they showed an affection for the British people that will never fade. But with every day that passes, 
the chances for a timely agreement do start to fade. Negotiations are always difficult, and we are used to that. And the Commission has the best and most experienced negotiator, Michel Barnier, to navigate us through that. But talks have not progressed as the we would have wished, and that leaves us very little time. As ever, as ever, this House will be the first to know, and it will be the one that has the last say. And I can assure you we will continue to update you thoroughly, just as we did with the withdrawal agreement. This withdrawal agreement took three years to negotiate, and we worked relentlessly on it, line by line, word by word, and together we succeeded. And the result guarantees our citizens' rights, financial interests, the integrity of the single market, and crucially, the Good Friday Agreement. And the European Union and the UK jointly agreed it was the best and only way for ensuring peace on the island of Ireland. And we will never backtrack on that. And this agreement has been ratified by this House and by the House of Commons. It cannot be unilaterally changed, disregarded or disapplied. This is a matter of law and trust and good faith. And that is not just me saying it. I remind you of the words of Margaret Thatcher. I quote, Britain does not break treaties. It would be bad for Britain, bad for relations with the rest of the world, and bad for any future treaty on trade. End of quote. This was true then, and this is true today. <clears throat> Trust is the foundation of any strong partnership. And Europe will always be ready to build strong partnerships with our closest neighbours. This starts with the Western Balkans. The decision six months ago to open accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia was truly historical. Indeed, the future of the whole region lies in the European Union. We share the same history. We share the same destiny. The Western Balkans are part of Europe, and they are not just a stopover on the Silk Road. We will soon present an economic recovery package for the Western Balkans, focusing on a number of regional investment initiatives. And we will be there for the Eastern Partnership countries and our partners in the Southern neighborhood to help create jobs and kickstart their economies. When I came into office, I chose for the very first trip outside the European Union to visit the African Union, and it was a natural choice. It was a natural choice, and it was a very clear message, because we are not just neighbors, but we are natural partners. Three months later, I returned with my entire college to set out the priorities for our new strategy with Africa. It is a partnership of equals, where both sides share opportunities and responsibilities. Africa will be a key partner in building the world we want to live in, whether it is on climate, digital or trade. Honourable Members, we will continue to believe in open and fair trade across the world, not as an end in itself, but as a way to deliver prosperity at home and promote values and standards. More than 600,000 jobs in Europe are tied, for example, to the trade with Japan. And our recent agreement with Vietnam alone helped secure historic labor rights for millions of workers in the country. We will use our diplomatic strength and economic clout to broker agreements that make a difference, such as de designating maritime protected areas in the Antarctica. This would be one of the biggest acts of environmental protection in history. We will form high ambition coalitions on issues such as the digital ethics of fighting deforestation. 
And we will develop partnerships with all like-minded partners from Asian democracies to Australia, Africa, the Americas, and anyone else who wants to join. We will work on just globalization. We cannot take this for granted. We must insist on fairness and a level playing field. And Europe will always move forward alone or with partners to do that. I want to come back to the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Carbon must have its price because nature cannot pay this price anymore. And this carbon border adjustment mechanism should motivate foreign producers and EU importers to reduce their carbon emissions while ensuring that we level the playing field in a WTO compatible way. And the same principle applies to digital taxation. We will spare no effort to reach agreement in the framework of OECD and G20, but let there be no doubt should an agreement fall short of a fair tax system that provides long-term sustainable revenues, Europe will come forward with a proposal early next year. I want Europe to be a global advocate for that. <clears throat> Honourable members, if Europe is to play a vital role in the world, it must also create new vitality inside. And to move forward, we must now overcome the differences that held us back. The historic agreement on next generation EU shows that it can be done. And the speed with which we took decisions on fiscal rules, state aid or sure, all this shows it can be done. So let's do it. Migration is an issue that has been discussed long enough. Migration has always been a fact for Europe, and it will always be. Throughout centuries, it has defined our societies, it has enriched our cultures, and it has shaped many of our lives. And this will always be the case. As we all know, the 2015 migration crisis caused many deep divisions between member states, with some of those scars still healing today. A lot has been done since, but a lot is still missing. If we are all ready to make compromises without compromising on our principles, we can find a solution. Next week, the Commission will put forward its pact on migration. We will take a human and humane approach and there are principles. Saving lives at sea is not optional. <clears throat> and those countries who fulfill their legal and moral duties or are more exposed than others must be able to rely on the solidarity of our whole European Union. We will ensure a closer link between asylum and return. We have to make a clear distinction between those who have the right to stay and those who do not. We will take action to fight smugglers, strengthen external borders, deepen external partnerships and create legal pathways. And we will make sure that people who have the right to stay are integrated and made to feel welcome. They have a future to build and skills, energy and talent. I think of Swat, the teenage Syrian refugee who arrived in Europe dreaming of being a medical doctor. Within three years, she was awarded a prestigious scholarship from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. I think of the Libyan and Somalian refugee doctors who offered their medical skills the moment the pandemic stuck in France. And last year, I told you of the story of Muas, whom I had the 
honor to meet. He is studying physics today in Europe. Honorable members, if we think about what they have overcome and what they have achieved, then we simply must be able to manage the question of migration together. The images of the Moria camp are a painful reminder of the need for Europe to come together. Everybody has to take a step up here and take responsibility. And the Commission will just do that. The Commission is now working on a plan for joint pilot with the Greek authorities for a new camp on Lesbos. We can assist with asylum and return processes and significantly improve the conditions for the refugees. But I want to be clear. If we step up, then I expect all member states to step up too. Migration is a European challenge, and a whole of Europe must do its part. We must rebuild the trust among us and move forward together. And this trust is at the very heart of our union and the way we do things together. It is anchored in our founding values, our democracies, and in our community of law, as Walter Hallstein used to say. This is not an abstract term. The rule of law helps protect people from the rule of the powerful. It is the guarantor of our most basics of everyday rights and freedoms. It allows us to give our opinion and to be informed by a free press. Before the end of the month, the Commission will adopt the first annual rule of law report covering all member states. It is a preventive tool for early detection of challenges and for finding solutions. I want this to be a starting point for Commission, Parliament and Member States to ensure there is no backsliding. The Commission attaches the highest importance to the rule of law. And this is why we will ensure that money from our budget and next generation EU is protected against any kind of fraud, corruption or conflict of interest. This is non-negotiable. But the last month have also reminded us how fragile it can be. We have a duty to always be vigilant to care and nurture for the rule of law, and breaches of the rule of law cannot be tolerated. I will continue to defend it and the integrity of our European institutions, be it about the primacy of European law, the freedom of the press, the independence of the judiciary, or the sale of golden passports. European values are not for sale. And honourable members, these values are more important than ever. I say that because when I think of the State of the Union, I am reminded of the words of John Hume, one of the great Europeans who sadly passed away this year. If so many people live in peace today on the island of Ireland, it is in large part because of his unwavering belief in humanity and conflict resolution. He used to say that conflict was about difference and that peace was about respect for difference. And as he so rightly reminded this House in 1998, and I quote, the European visionaries decided that difference is not a threat Difference is natural. Difference is the essence of humanity. End of quote. And these words are just as important today as they ever have been.
Because when I look around, we ask ourselves, where is the essence of humanity when three children in Wisconsin watch their father shot by the police while they sit in the car? Where is the essence of humanity when anti-Semitic carnival costumes openly parade in our streets? Where is the essence of humanity when every single day Roma people are excluded from society and others held back simply because of the color of their skin or their religious belief? I am proud to live in Europe in this open society of values and diversity. But even here in this union, these stories are a daily reality for so many people. And this reminds us that progress on fighting racism and hate is fragile. It is hard won, but very easily lost. So now is the moment to make change, to build a truly anti-racist union that goes from condemnation to action. And the Commission is putting forward an action play plan to start making that happen. As part of this, we will propose to extend the list of EU crimes to all forms of hate crime and hate speech, whether because of race, religion, gender or sexuality. Hate is hate and no one should have to put up with that. We will strengthen our racial inequality laws where there are gaps. We will use our budget to address discrimination in areas such as employment, housing or health care. We will get tougher on enforcement when implementation lags behind. Because in this union, fighting racism will never be optional. We will improve education and knowledge on the historical cultural causes of racism. We will tackle unconscious bias that exists in people, in institutions, well, yes, and even in algorithms. And we will appoint the Commission's first ever anti-racism coordinator to keep this at the top of our agenda and to work directly with people, civil society, and institutions. Honorable members, I will not rest when it comes to building a union of equality. A union where you can be who you are and love who you want without fear and recrimination. Because being yourself is not your ideology, it is your identity, and no one can ever take it away. So I want to be crystal clear, LGBTQI free zones are humanity free zones, and they have no place in our union. And to make sure that we support the whole community, the Commission will soon put forward a strategy to strengthen LGBTQI rights. As part of this, I will also push for mutual recognition of family relations in the EU. Because if you are a parent in one country, you are, of course, a parent in every country. Mesdames et Messieurs les députés. Ladies and gentlemen, members of Parliament, this is the world that we want to live in. 
It is a world where we are united in diversity and adversity. A world where we work together to overcome our differences and when we support each other in the difficult times. We are talking about a world of tomorrow that is stronger, more respectful, more healthy, a world that we are building to leave to our children. While we are teaching our children how to live, they are teaching us what life means. This year has showed that more than ever. There are millions of young people who are calling on us to enact change for a healthier planet, or the hundreds of thousands of children who put up beautiful rainbows in their windows as a sign of solidarity all across Europe. There is one image, though, that has really stayed with me over these last six months. It is an image which shows us the world through the eyes of our children. That is the image of Carola and Vittoria, two young girls who were playing tennis on the roofs of Liguria in Italy during the lockdown. It was not just their courage and their talent that shone through in this image, but it is also the lesson that they can teach us. It is a lesson to never give up when faced with obstacles, that you should never let conventions hold you back and that you should always seize the moment. That is what Carola, Vittoria and all the young people of Europe teach us every day about how to live. This is the future generation of Europeans, next generation EU. This year, Europe has taken up their example and made a step forward together. When we needed to find a way forward for our future, we did not let outdated conventions hold us back. When we felt a fragility around us, we seized the moment to give fresh impetus to our union. When we had the opportunity to go it alone, as we have done in the past, we chose to use the full strength of the 27 to give all 27 a chance for the future. We have shown that we are in this together and that we will overcome this together. Ladies and gentlemen, members of Parliament, the future will be what we make of it, and Europe will be what we want it to be. We should stop trying to break it down and instead build it up to make it stronger and to build the world that we want to live in. Long live Europe. Long live Europe.